my goal in this series of lectures is to uh, present another work uh, by Yamanoi on uh, intersections of entire curves inside abelian varieties with a higher co-dimensional uh, loci. So before doing that, I plan on using that first hour to do some uh, short introduction to uh, Neman linear theory. So I believe that everyone in the room uh, already knows a lot about that. So maybe this is, um, I don't know, more to the benefit of people uh, looking at uh, that uh, abroad or away. So um, let me just, my, my goal will be to introduce uh, some results that we'll, I will use tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, so that uh, hopefully everything will be uh, self-included. So let me um, maybe start by explaining what uh, the goal of this uh, first hour will be. So we, the way I look at neven linear theory is uh, mainly to generate a transcendental setting, some very classical results that are known uh, in, uh, say, classical intersection theory. So my goal will be to generate the following to uh, a transcendental setting. So first of all, take, say, a complex projective manifold. Okay, you consider a divisor on it. And uh, it's associated line bundles. Okay, so now if you take a curve inside X, which is uh, say not included in D, curve, well, maybe let me even take a morphism from a curve to X such that uh, the image is not included in D, then we have the Le Long point Poincaré formula, which gives you an, inequali an equality between two uh, integers. So on the first hand, what you can do is to integrate on C the pullback of the first chunk class of F. And here, what I mean is that uh, you can see the, for example, this first term class as a cohomology class on uh, Z. And this turns out to be equal to uh, the degree on C of the pullback of D. So here, we have to look at this number as a some sort of counting uh, the zeros and poles of uh, D, so it really depends on D. And this depends only on the, this version class of this line bundle, depends on the line bundle L. And for example, you could compute it by taking a metric <laughs> on L, and you could compute its first churn form. So this will be uh, some one one form on uh, on x. So usually when we write equalities like that, we don't think too much about that. But I what I want to emphasize is that there are these are not the same objects on the left and right. There is a theorem behind that, uh, telling you that you can comp compute an intersection number using, uh, for example, a uh, real differential form. Uh, so one goal would be to uh, generalize that, say goal one, generalize this to uh, an entire curve, transcendental entire curve. So this first goal will be complete once we have what we call the first main theorem in Vanina theory. Second goal uh, is to generalize uh, something else, on, uh, which is so also true in the complex projective settings. So 
again, take X a complex projective variety. And now, uh, say manifold. And I will take a um, curve, but not any curve. I will consider either P1 or an elliptic curve. So non hyperbolic And again, consider a morphism from C to X. So now what you can do uh, is to construct the following diagram. So you have X. You can projectivize, I will write it in a geometric manner, projectivize its cotangent bundle. And you can do the same with the C. So of course, if you projectivize this cotangent bundle on C, you have an isomorphism because uh, this cotangent bundle is just the canonical line bundle. It's a, it's a dimension one, uh, a rank one vector bundle on C. but now what happens is that if you pull back the tautological line bundle on X, well, so you have the, you can write uh, a formula using the ramification of this map, so this map F, and you have an inequality like that, meaning that the difference of the two line bundles can be written as an effective, uh, effective line bundle. And here on the, this right hand side, this identifies with the canonical line bundle of C. So if you take the degrees, then you get, so sorry, I forgot to pull back here, thus the degree on C of this uh, pullback is uh, smaller than the degree on C of the canonical line bundle, which is uh, non positive. So if you have a non-hyperbolic curve, then if writing this sort of diagram, you get a non-positive line bundle pulling back the tautological line bundle on this projectivized bundle. And so the goal uh, will be to generalize that fact, but starting from another sort of non-hyperbolic uh, curve, namely, um, the plane C. So uh, let me say that one of the things that would be uh, obtained by Nevalina theory is to, as I said, give another meaning to this uh, sort of integral, which it could be given by the Nevalina characteristic function. And this function will uh, also be applicable to this line bundle and say the goal two. Yeah, state that for f starting from c going to x, we also have uh, this pullback in a suitably generalized sense that is, and this will be given. Maybe I can already say it here. Uh, this will be given by the so-called tautological inequality. And so once uh, we have these two facts, actually, uh, we will have everything that is needed to understand uh, Yamanoi's proof, uh, Yamanoi's work on uh, higher codimensional subsets in Abelian variants. Okay, so let me now introduce uh, the tools that are used in evaluation theory. So, as I said, we'll go on to prove the um, first main theorem, which will uh, be the equivalent of this uh, good one. Classical functionals in Nevalina theory. Okay. 
Okay, so first of all, let me uh, recall one formula which is uh, essential to all these uh, things, namely the Benson formula. So well, I will state it that way. So consider a function starting from C going to uh, say R. For the time being, I will just write infinity. Then we have the following equalities. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to put something which is uh, very classical in the vanilla theory. Namely, I will integrate say, between uh, two radius, two radii, some weighted logarithmic integral. And what do I integrate? I integrate the value of uh, the disk of radius t inside the disk. Uh, I integrate this. So I will write 1 over 2 pi i d d mm -hmm. pi. And here there is some constant, which I always mix up, but I think this is the right one. So this integral can be written as the difference between two uh, mean values. So by this, I don't want to write every all the time one over two pi, uh, but this is the mean value of the function uh, phi over the disk of radius R2, or R1 here, sorry, minus the mean value of the same function over the disk of radius R0. Okay, so one has this formula, and you can also generalize that to functions which are, well, you can write versions for PSH functions. The one that I will use in the, in the following generalizes or also applies to f uh, function phi, which locally can be written as something which is a C infinity plus a sum of a logarithm, logarithm of distances to points. Okay, so if you have a function which has analytic singularities in that way, then applying the DD bar operator to these sort of things will give you a The important fact is to use this. If you apply i over 2 pi dd bar to some logarithm, you get a Dirac uh, function. And you can plug that in. And that will be uh, the thing giving the first main theorem, actually. OK, so with this out of the way, I can define the characteristic functions. So consider again a complex manifold. Okay, to define the fun to define the function, it's not necessary to assume projective, but maybe I will do it uh, right away to avoid the problems in my definitions later. So complex projective manifold uh, curve starting from C going to X, an entire curve. And now, um, yeah, let me define the following. Pick uh, one one form, real one one form on X. Then you can define the characteristic function of F with respect to alpha starting from R plus going to uh, R. So you take a radius, small r, and you compute uh, this integral, actually. So integral between 0 and R, d over dt over t. And now you pull back to the disk of radio, radii t, this alpha. Uh, 
So this is the characteristic function of um, f with respect to alpha, or maybe alpha with respect to f. Well, doesn't really matter. OK, and first important fact is that if you use Jensen's formula, you see that actually up to a constant, or at least up to something bounded, this function does not depend on uh, the choice of alpha in its cohomology class. So if I take phi, a infinity function on x going to r, then computing this and the same characteristic function, but this time with respect to i d d bar phi. Well, you can plug this alpha plus i d d bar phi inside the Jensen's formula, and you will find that you have a difference between two mean values. But this phi here is bounded on the compact x. So you find that these two are equal up to something bounded on x. This is actually smaller than uh, say one. So there is a two pi somewhere, but uh, smaller than something which is bounded by the L infinity uh, norm of phi. All right, so this allows you to define up to some constant, something depending only on a cohomology class. So definition. So this time I will pick directly aligned by no. And x. So I define the characteristic function of f with respect to L to be say, any characteristic function of f with respect to an element inside the person class of L. For example, the I could take the first um, yeah, the first churn form of L with respect to any smooth metric. And say this function is defined up to a bounded function. So why are these type of functions useful in uh, the study of hyperbolicity? Well, it comes, well, there are several, several reasons for that. Uh, but one of them is the following theorem, say. So take uh, omega a uh, killer form. On x. Then, using this type of characteristic functions, or well, maybe that one, uh, we can formulate a criterion for an entire curve to actually be uh, algebraic. So consider an entire curve starting from C. Assume so this theorem is actually an equivalent, but let me state it only in one way. Assume that this uh, characteristic function is bounded as a big O of log R. Then the conclusion of the theorem Uh, is that it extends across infinity to a map, an algebraic map from P1 to F. So I'm not exactly sure who to credit for this theorem, uh, who stated it first. Um, um, I don't know, actually. So I think this was used by many people, but uh, different forms. And also, uh, let you let me remark that, for example, you can apply this theorem to pick a numpole line bundle on the projective variety. Then uh, this applies if you assume you could you can replace this assumption by the assumption that. The characteristic function of f with respect to your ample line model is a big O of log R. 
and you see that the fact that the definition depends is only defined, say, up to uh, an addition of a bounded function does not matter. This will not change this hypothesis. Okay, so the proof of this uh, result is actually uh, maybe writing the details. Um, take a little bit of time, but actually the idea of the proof is very simple. So under the, this assumption, If you write what this uh, characteristic function is, well, you can show quite easily that these terms inside the integral must be bounded by some constant. There exists a positive constant such that C bounds this. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this uh, logarithmic bound. Yeah. Exercise. And then, if you now, so the idea is to use, uh, B, to use Bishop's theorem. So you apply Bishop's theorem to the function starting from the pointed disk and going to x by applying. Uh, sending t over f over the uh, f applied to the inverted coordinate. And then you deduce that the area of um, say, the pullback by g of the kernel form on the pointed disk is finite. And by Bishop theorem, g extends across the origin because you are computing the area with respect to some color form in the hypothesis. Yes? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, That, that's true. So what I meant by Keller, so in Keller, I don't want to emphasize the fact that the form is closed, but the fact that it is positive definite at every point. Yeah, uh, maybe I will. So I wrote Keller because eventually it will be applied to um, the first term form of a line bundle, so that in, it is in uh, some homology class. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so um, let me say that usually when uh, one tries to prove this kind of theorem, there, there was, um, one or two years ago, the classical proof it was to reduce to the case of a image of a map from C to P1. And I think to the best of my knowledge, the first person who remarked that you could do this kind of trick using the Bishop's theorem was Yadeng. But yeah, I don't know if it was remarked before. <coughs> All right, so what do I want to say next? Yes. So I have introduced this characteristic function and explained how it is useful to say proving hyperbolicity statements. And now let me introduce the famous counting functions. So consider a divisor on X, the effective divisor, even though it's not strictly necessary. And again, an entire curve, not falling inside B, inside the support of B. So we can define uh, the, the, 
a counting function, which again uh, will be defined as a map starting from R plus and going to, uh, to R. Maybe let me write it that way. And in a manner which is uh, very similar to the definition of the characteristic function, you just integrate with uh, some logarith logarithmic weights. Um, yeah, I will write it like that. The pullback of the divisor, or maybe the degree of this pullback on the disk of radius t. So here I just mean you count with multiplicities the points uh, lying inside the disk delta t uh, that are sent to d. Okay, and you can also define truncated versions. It can be uh, very useful in some context. Context. So if I pick k integer larger than one, uh, you can define the same sort of integral, but where you truncate the multiplicities to other k. So here, take the sum over the elements inside the disk of radius t of uh, the minimum between k and the order at the point of the pullback of Okay, and now I am almost ready to state what will be the equivalent in this uh, transcendental setting of the Lulong Poincaré formula. So this Lulong Poincaré formula would like to, ideally, what we would like to compare Goal one, sorry. Okay. Amounted to compare once you take the line model associated to some uh, divisor. We want to compare the counting function with respect to D and the characteristic function with respect to L. And to do that, we are lacking one ingredient, namely the proximity function. So same context as before, I take the line bundle associated to an effective divisor. And on this line bundle, I will consider a smooth metric. Okay, and now let me define Maybe I introduced that less ingredient before the definition, sorry. So this divisor D is effective. So it is defined by some section, non-vanishing section that vanishes precisely at D. So you take any section defining D, they are proportional up to some complex constant. Now the definition. So the proximity function of f with respect to d is defined as the mean value on the circle of radius r. So again, it depends on some real number inside r plus of the uh, logarithm. So minus the logarithm of the norm of S for the metric H. So I, yeah, there might be some constant needed. Um, here, I think the one half of uh, yes, uh, before will account for the fact that I'm not putting a two. Yeah. Okay, so remarks about that function. So you can see that somehow it measures the proximity as indicated by the name of uh, f and d on this circle. So the smaller this number is, meaning that f is very close to, to d, the larger this number, uh, the closer, say, f is to d on the circle 
of radius r, the larger the proximity function is. Also, this proximity function, you can see that it depends on the choice of some smooth metric. So if you want to remove that depend, the fact that it depends. So you can say that the proximity function is defined up to some constant. And it will also remove the dependency on S. And if you pick correctly the this bounding function, we can see easily, since uh, this function is bounded from above, uh, that up to some constant, this function is bound. It, you can assume that it is positive. Up to a bounded function. All right, and now we can state the Vanina's first main theorem. So these are again in the same hypothesis. So take x complex projective and fold the uh, effective divisor on x and define take L to be the associated line moment. And then we have the following equality. So on the right hand side, you will have a characteristic function of f with respect to l. And on the left hand side, you will have, if you, you had the immediate generalization, say, you would have the counting function of f with respect to d. So this would be a direct generalization of the long point carry formula. But as I said, you need to account for an error term here. And as before, this is true up to some body function. It doesn't matter in the end. So to prove this, this is uh, very easy. So let me just say how we can prove that before determining some remarks or consequences. To do the proof, you just have to apply Jensen's formula to uh, the function phi, which you can take to be uh, the logarithm of uh, the norm squared of uh, the section at the point f of z. So if you do that, so say using the fact, okay, maybe let me give you some details here. So locally, so what you will plug in the formula is to, I will detail locally what is the IDG bar of that. And uh, in the end you plug that in the formula and you get these terms. So locally, if H is given by uh, say exponential minus psi, Citing some C infinity weights. Then one has so I over two pi d d bar phi, which is I over two pi d d bar of the logarithm. Of Uh, say of the, so I have this psi here, so minus psi directly, minus psi. And here you will have the logarithm 
of the Euclidean norm, once you have written this in local coordinates, of um, S at the point F of D. And so if you do uh, I over 2 pi dd bar of minus psi, you find minus the first term form of L with respect to H. And here you will find, by what I explained before, the sum of uh, the points which are in the set where you are doing this local computation uh, of the multiplicity at the point the fullback of D times the direct function at the point A. And so if you plug that in the formula, you will have the integral um, of this so on the right hand side, the integral over u over dt of this applied to minus this first term form will give you minus the characteristic function of f with respect to l. This will give you the counting function. And on the left hand side, there you apply Jensen's formula and you get the mean value of C of the disk of, on the circle of radius zero minus the other mean value, which I will put inside some O1. And this is the characteristic, the proximity function. And there is a one half here that makes disappear this uh, two. Okay, so pull that, uh, sorry, there is IDD bar log and there was a minus one, sorry. So pull that on the other top, on the other side and this one as well, and you get uh, the first matrix. Okay, so yeah, maybe I want to go into the um, topological inequality, but maybe let me, um, what do I want to say? Yeah, maybe a consequence. That can be interesting. As I said, this proximity function is always, you can always assume it's positive as to some uh, bounded function. So one consequence is that this characteristic function is always greater than the counting function with respect to D. So the more F hits D, the larger the, say, the areas of this computed, for example, with respect to a, a one form associated to L is, uh, is big. Okay. Um, but now, let me go on to the, the second goal I talk uh, in my introduction, so, which will be given by the tautological inequality. So let me directly take it. Uh, under some form, which I think uh, was, so there are several versions of this uh, of what we can call a tautological inequality, but let me state one of them, which is used to Macmillan. So take X complex projective manifold. And an entire curve. So what you can do is to consider the lift of x to its uh, to the total space of its tangent bundle. And this total space you can in turn embed inside some uh, confusion, which I will write as the projectivization for the lines of the tangent bundle plus the, the, the trivial line bundle on x. So here you have some affine space inside, inside this completion, which is the tangent bundle. Okay, and what? Right. 
is set by this tautological inequality is no. If you look at the O1 on that space, you can see that morally it's also um, it is sort of uh, an equivalent of the O1 on this productization. And I said in my goal two that we would like the pullback of the O1 on some uh, projectivized gen bundle to be uh, small. And this is pre precisely what is said by the, the theorem. So if you consider the characteristic function of this lift with respect to the O1 on that space, well, it is very small, and namely, it is a big O. So I will be more precise in a minute, but it is very small compared to the logarithm, right, smaller than the logarithm of the characteristic function of f with respect to an ample line bundle of x plus some log. And actually, this inequality might not be true on all r plus, but outside for r belonging to r plus minus some set with finite length. Okay, so again, this tells you that if you consider uh, what would be the generalization of the intersection number of F1 with respect to the topological line bundle on the first stage of a jet tower, then this is very small compared to uh, well, the natural thing that you can use to uh, uh, compute the growth of F on X. Okay, so I will, um, I don't know what time it is. Yeah, so I will uh, do the proof. So to prove that, what you can do is to pick inside uh, this completion, you can consider the hyperplane at infinity, well, hypersurface at infinity. And you can use that hypersurface to compute the term on the left-hand side. And then the O1 on this uh, projectization is uh, same thing as the O of, of the, uh, the line bundle associated to this divisor. And thus, by the first main theorem, the left hand side is equal to first the counting function of F with respect to H, but you can see that F I, F1, sorry does not touch H. So the counting function is actually zero. And thus, this term is just given by the proximity function. So now it's just a manner, but just, not just, but what we have to do is to uh, introduce some objects to compute this proximity function. And that will be given by a metric on the O1. So let H be a smooth metric first on the tangent bundle. So it induces a metric on uh, the tangent bundle plus the trivial light bundle, so H plus identity. And let uh, me uh, denote by H tilde the induced metric on the tautological line bundle. 
So using, using that, you can now take um, well, standard section of O1 cutting out H and compute now the character the proximity function. Sorry. So the proximity function is the mean value of minus the logarithm of this with respect to H tilde. And now you can do the exercise where it's uh, not really hard. But you, if you express explicitly what this is, this is just the logarithm of one. So maybe there is a one half somewhere. One plus f prime of t squared with respect to h. So why is that? So it's simply because uh, the if you compute the lift, the f one here. Uh, this is F1 there. Yeah. F1 of T. Well, F1 of T is given by something which also gives a section of O minus one, which is just taking F prime of T on the factor. Uh, tangent bundle and one from the second one. So this gives you a section of the tautological line bundle O minus one. If you if you compute that norm for this metric, this is precisely what you get. This is the square norm of this for the metric induced on the uh, O minus one. So. Okay, so now you have the expression of the proximity function. And you can see, for example, that it is it goes to infinity if f prime goes to infinity. So if you get get close to h, then this blows up. This goes to infinity. Okay. Now we want to write several inequalities. So maybe uh, here, I will go quite quick. You can use, for example, that I want to get rid of this one here. So you can use the fact that logarithm of a plus b is smaller than logarithm, the maximum of the logarithm of 2a and logarithm of 2b. So if you do that, you get smaller than the maximum of 0 and 1 half times the mean value of the logarithm of twice this term. Okay, I get rid of the two here by saying that I consider everything up to something. Okay, so this is the term we want to work on and eventually to say that it is very small. So, remark. Uh, I don't, yeah. If omega is the metric The one one form on X associated to H, the metric that we had taken on the X. So, for example, you can assume that omega is scalar, but it is not strictly necessary, as said before. One has that if you take the characteristic function of F with respect to omega. So let me recall how it is here. It is the integral of this. Well, by derivating this expression, you can get back to uh, the this one. So how do you do that? Well, first you can derive it with respect to R. And this gets rid of this integral. Then you multiply it by uh, R. 
So it gets rid of this one over t. And then if you derive that, again, well, you get the derivative of this integral. And there was a mean value, some, uh, yeah. And this is um, two pi r times the mean value of this function. Okay, so now we're almost there. What I want to do is to uh, bound from above this by uh, the So however, if you consider now the mean value of this uh, logarithm, that, uh, you can use Jensen's formula, well, the, the one that we learned in first year of university, not the one from above, uh, which tell you that since log is a concave function, the mean value of the logarithm is smaller than the logarithm of the mean value. And the circle radius r. And this mean value here, I will this time write as the true integral divided by one over two pi r. Maybe uh, let me get rid, get rid of that. Okay, so this is the logarithm of this integral on the circle. Minus uh, the logarithm of R, say, minus logarithm of 2 pi R. Okay, and so here you have logarithm of that, which turns out to be equal to the logarithm of this. Again, equal logarithm of d over dr r over dr the characteristic function plus say a big o so. yes yeah uh, so when i was young i uh, learned that as a transcends formula but maybe it's a concavity of log Oh, come. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now very uh, eventually the idea behind that is that when you have a function, any function from R to R, this function cannot be uh, too big compared to its first derivative because if its first derivative is big, then the function will grow and be very big. And so this is in the this idea. Uh, can be made precise in some lemma that will be eventually used to bound that by this, this logarithm, by the logarithm of this actually. So consider a function starting from R first going to R, say uh, C infinity, uh, such that non decreasing. And going to infinity. Then, for any delta positive number, one has that the function itself, sorry, the derivative of the function itself, can be bounded outside some exceptional subset by the function to the power one plus delta. So if the derivative is large, then the function has to be also. And the proof, So this is very easy. 
simply we want to show that the locus where this is not true has finite length. And so this inequality will be true outside some exceptional locus inside R plus of finite. So call E the set of T such that this inequality doesn't hold. And now the length of E for the, the Borel measure of R plus is smaller than that smaller than the integral over E of one. Well, this is the definition of this length. But on E, one is smaller than F prime of T divided by this. Okay, so this integral over E is of course smaller than the same integral over R plus because everything is positive in this uh, inequality by our assumptions. And now to conclude, you make a change of variables. You take uh, Y equal F of T and you get the integral between F of zero and plus infinity of d, say dy over y to the power one plus delta, which is finite. So the length of E is finite and you get this. So maybe I can conclude here. So to uh, get the uh, tautological inequality, you can apply this lemma first to uh, this first derivative, you can check quite easily that R d over dr of this satisfies the hypothesis on f of t here. And so you get that outside some exceptional subset, taking uh, delta to your liking, take a positive delta, uh, you get one plus delta logarithm of everything that appears after this first derivative. And there is again this whole plot R. And now you, so you see uh, before that I had a logarithm of this to the power of one plus delta. I put the one plus delta before the logarithm. And now you apply this again. Apply this again. And you will get, uh, so this one plus delta logarithm of R can be put on the right. And you get logarithm of D over DR of this, which is again smaller than one plus delta logarithm of this. So you get a one plus delta squared logarithm of this characteristic. <laughs> And this is again true outside some exceptional subject. All right. Uh, and so this uh, concludes the proof because uh, what we had done before here was to say that this proximity function is uh, smaller than the maximum between um, Oh, there is a maximum with zero, which is weird. Yeah, so, no, no, it's perfect normal. Maximum between zero and uh, this term, which turns out to be smaller than this uh, logarithm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe there is a square. Yes. Yes, uh, you're right. So maybe I forgot a square. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay, so yeah, you, you're right. So I'm not claiming that uh, everything I said is uh, here. Um, yeah, um, yeah, because here, uh, this you're right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're you're perfectly right. Uh, what I wrote here is not correct. There is a square. Thank you. Uh, but since there is a logarithm everywhere, it's Yes, in the end. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm uh, over time. Uh, maybe if you allow me, I will just state the corresponding result uh, with jets, the one that I will use. Uh, or maybe I, I will start tomorrow by recalling that result with jets. So maybe I will. Just stop here and stop tomorrow by explaining. So, thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, you're right. So uh, I think if you want to use JET, so what Yamanoid does in this paper, so maybe I can just say that, usually he stays in the quasi-projective setting somehow when he considers the gate jets of an abelian variety. So he does this. And what he tends to do is to uh, embed the fiber inside the what, some compactification in, instead of projectivizing. And uh, well, in that setting, you can do all, exactly the same. So you can consider the characteristic function with respect to the O1, which becomes the proximity function with respect to the divisor at infinity. So expressing yeah, a proximity function with the divisor at infinity is quite easy to do. And also, if you have this, so eventually what uh, Yamano does, again, is to uh, Consider some, uh, we'll see that tomorrow, but he constructs some some cycles inside these uh, objects, which you can uh, construct fiber wise with respect to this projection. So maybe if you projectivize this set, I think you can do exactly the same, but you will have to write things in homogeneous coordinates, maybe. So it might become a bit more complicated, but, but too complicated to use the projectivized version instead of this affine version. Yes, but I think the these cycles he constructs are very easy to, to do in using that, uh, that version. Uh, I think it basically com comes from this. Yes. Again, he, he writes everything in terms of uh, Characteristic functions or proximity functions with respect to this device are at infinity, and that's why I chose to do the same.
Yeah, I think there are of many ways of stating uh, things and computations, but in the end, due to technical reasons, somehow some of them are many uh, have advantages compared to the other. Even though the natural objects that are in front of them are, is the same uh, all the time. But here, I think this is mainly for a technical reason that, it, uh, that you can define quite easily these uh, things. Mm -hmm. 